Hey, my little glib glob. Last board, last outrider back. How are you doing? Having a good day? That's great. I'm having a good day too. We're going to talk about the Primarchs. The Primarchs are probably, in my opinion, the biggest thing that has changed over the last 10 years or so in 40K. Uh, uh, I think a lot of the change has occurred really in the last three years when they started the Horus Heresy books. And a lot of it occurred after Andy Chambers left and they decided that they're going to give us all the nitty-gritty details of the, of the Imperium. The Primarchs changed the most because I believe they're going to make a game that allows us to play uh, the, the, the Horus Heresy. With all this writing, I, I, there's something going to be come out that's going to allow us to play the Horus Heresy. And to do that, you're going to have to be able to play Primarchs. And to do that, Primarchs are going to have to be reduced in power to a scale that they can exist in a 40k game. That's the biggest change that I see. Over the last uh, few years since Horus Rising, the Primarchs powers in the books and descriptions of them have really solidified they were really kind of vague at first indicating that gw is probably working on what the hell a primarch really is uh same with custodes uh they've also changed a lot and fleshed out the details on the who exactly they are what exactly they are what are their power levels what are the type of abilities they're going to have in 40k when they eventually appear in the game it's all there the big thing that I see about the Primarchs is, as I said, they're dialing down the power. You go back to the Istvan, the first descriptions of the Istvan massacres and things like that. Primarchs were wading through Space Marines like freaking nothing. They would just, whoop, I swing my, uh, my mace, my sword, my whatever. 20 Space Marines go flying 500 meters into the distance to be dying instantly so on and so forth and gran you know jumps out of a freaking drop pod by himself and then so, what digs 200 meters straight down with his hands um lion the lion punched the head off of an avatar with a single blow when he was visiting one of the eldar maiden planets right um I mean, it goes on. They now that they're solidifying in power, especially with this last book, the um, Unremembered Empire. They've definitely set a fixed point for the power of Primarchs at being they're going to be able to fight a Space Marine squad unarmed in a locked room. That, that's that's what they'll be able to do, pretty much. Uh, Gilliman did it, and now what? Uh, I think, didn't the lion? Oh, uh, Conrad Cruz did it with uh, a team of uh, a squad, a pack of space wolves. That was it. So that's definitely the clear message I'm getting there. That could fit into a game. That is a power level you can understand. One Primarch. 10 tactical space marines. They should be able to charge up and he should be able to smack them dead unarmed. Which, that's how I see it going. Now, as for the powers and relationships of the Primarch, if you read a series of books called Amber Series or the Great Book of Amber or the Amber Trilogy by Roger Zelezny, you're going to see a similar thing there. It's going to be, there is an emperor, a great godlike father figure emperor. Uh, there's no mother. And yet there's a bunch of uh, kids. Uh, fortunately in that one, there were brothers and sisters. And since that they're all the kids of this one uh, godlike being, um, they start ranking themselves among themselves so for example of there and then they choose who you get support of that the, the the politics of the family tends to become who has the best strength so for example who's the best in hand-to-hand -hand combat 
okay, so if you have an argument between brothers and you're able to get the guy who's the best in hand-to-can combat, the strongest one, to support you, you've got an advantage because nobody else in the family is able to beat this guy in hand-to-hand combat. So if he's angry and he comes after you, you lose. Why? Because the family, the brothers and sisters, they all have fixed abilities and traits and personalities and skills and flaws and everything like that. You're going to have a smartest, you're going to have a dumbest, you're going to have a strongest, you're going to have a tallest, a shortest, a cutest, a whateverist. And they're going to rank the Primarchs in this way. And once they do that, then you're going to be able to have this interfamily, intersibling dynamic that they're going to start writing stories on. There's going to be all types of Primark stories, I'm betting, that just occur during that 200, 250 years of the Great Crusade. Forget the Horus Heresy. This will all be before the Horus Heresy. It'll be like the pre-Dune books where they had like House Atreides and everything like that. You're going to eventually get these whole long series of books that just detail each of the legions during their 200-year Great Crusade travels, their battles and friendships and stories and whatever, and you'll be able to play those out. Fuck 40K. You'll be able to sit there with your favorite legion and your Primarch and just uh, explore the galaxy, as it were. Those be an emperor and everything like that. It'll just be the age of the Imperium instead of an age of uh, darkness and war. I definitely see that coming in probably the next five years or so. But to do that, you're going to have to flesh out the Primarchs completely and have their storylines. So you're going to Vulcan Lives. That act, that shows right there that they're willing to completely rewrite and answer the unanswered questions. And the last thing that falls into place are the two unnamed Primarchs. Hopefully, I have my fingers crossed, they're going to be sisters. Yes, daughters of the Emperor. Uh, and they might actually come into play. Uh, that, might, that would be cool. Like I said, at least the Lesney had... had uh, sisters in the family. Granted, they were all idiots and uh, they never really had any major story or roles in the story, so really it was all brothers. <clears throat> but that's where I think they're going with this. Which is cool. Uh, they've already said Gulliman is the most human of the Primarchs. Which, by saying he's the most human, it also means he's the least supernatural of the Primarchs. So, so people are really going to be... I mean, if you remember, when you go back to Horus, uh, Horus Rising and everything like that, they didn't even allow people to look at the Primarchs. The generic description of any of the Primarchs in those early Horus Heresy books was just blowing human perception away. They just, you know, you look at a Primarch, you're, it just blows your fucking mind. You you collapse to the floor in awe of this godlike being that you can't even truly fully process their presence in the room with you. That's Horus Rising. To today, with Unremembered Empire, where Gilliman and Horus are the two most human of the Primarchs. The least supernatural of them. But uh, you have Sanguinius then, who's apparently now the most similar to the Emperor physically, which is interesting because in the last several books before that, Lorgar was supposed to be the most physically similar to the Emperor. Now, apparently, it's going to be Sanguinius, according to the other Primarchs, which really should be the, the seal of approval on that, assuming that they all know the Emperor the best and what he would or would not look like or be like. And they've said, or at least the Lion and Gilliman has said, uh, uh, that Sanguinius is the most like their father. They also mentioned a very interesting thing. One of the things that perhaps the reason why 
uh, the Ultramarines are so humane and Robert is so humane is because he's the only Primarch that had a mother. Yes, the head Chamberlain of Ultramar was apparently Gilliman's uh, mother figure. None of the other Primarchs had that, which could explain something about how the Emperor created him. That's another thing to remember about the Primarchs. The Primarchs did not evolve. Who they are, what they are, their powers, their abilities, their opinions, they were all handcrafted by the Emperor. They didn't become this way because of the planets that they were on. They, the planets were, again, selected by the Emperor for them to be dropped on. And I believe each one of them is to, is to represent some facet of humanity to be tested and shown to be whether it was strong enough to resist chaos or not and so on and so forth. But the fact that none of the, all of the Primarchs are handcrafted, it means all of their powers and personalities and likes and dislikes are all handcrafted too. Conrad Cruz, the Night Haunter, a psychopathic killer? Maybe. But if he is then he's a psychopathic killer created by the Emperor for a reason. Which means he's not just flawed. He's that way for a reason. He has powers and abilities and skills that were all implanted into him to make him the perfect psychopathic killer by the Emperor for a reason. Angron! One of my favorite Primarchs, by the way, because uh, he was always the one that's the hardest to explain. He gets these butcher's nails put into his head. What is his connection to his legion? Is he really just a crazy guy berserking around? Is that the depth of the character that they're going to give to him? No. Angron is the Emperor's guilt. That's what I see here. I think, I think Angron if he didn't have the butcher's nails in his head, would have been probably the noblest of all of the Primarchs. You're not really seeing Angron, who he is as a Primarch, because he's got these nails in his head, which makes him nuts. So who would he be without them? We don't know, but we have a hint. We have a hint in that he's basically the guilt-ridden. Primarch. He's the Primarch who led a revolution to free a planet, uh, vowed to have a last stand battle with his brothers and sisters in arms, to fight to the last, to die uh, together as a group, as a family, if you will. And right when they were all going to die, right when that money shot, the climactic scene in a movie, if it were, were to happen where everybody gets slaughtered, He's teleported out by the Emperor. Whoop! And all of his friends that are down there, sorry guys, uh, you're, you're all going to be led to believe that he just ran away at the last moment and, and left you to die. You know what I mean? That's not very nice of him. Not very nice at all. And that's his guilt. That's the guilt of Angron, the guilt, survivor's guilt. Uh, the rest of his legion can never really empathize with him because they're never going to have survivor's guilt. It's just not in their makeup. So they're all getting butcher's nails and trying to be tough and trying to push themselves as far as they can. When in reality, they can never really um, bond emotionally with, with Angron because unless they're all remorseful survivor's guilt crazies. Uh, Angron leaves the butcher's nails in his head, in my opinion, because if he takes them out, if he removes his suffering, then that is truly the final betrayal of all the people he left behind on his planet who died. Okay? He's now removed the butcher's nails, started a completely new life. Leading his legion, being a Primarch, uh, fuck all the promises he made to the people who he was supposed to die with. Uh, that's never going to happen. 
as far as I can see, he, he, he's loyal. I don't think he's ever turned to chaos. I think he has a death wish, but he obviously never turned to chaos. Uh, he's just guilt-ridden. Uh, he wants to die. And being a Primarch, it's really hard to find somebody to kill you. And being the physically strongest Primarch, making it the most ironic, <laughs> he's then even the toughest to kill. So it's like the Emperor is just fucking with him. But we know, we know the Emperor is doing that with all the Primarchs. So that's what I see with him. That's the point I see of the butcher's nail and the and and everything like that. It's I know I kind of went off. I, I'm going to talk more about other Primarchs and other videos. I'm already at 16 minutes. So I hope that wasn't too boring. Uh, I'll see you guys next time. Until then, bye.